What I want to do here today is I want to talk about the idea of where's your focus? Where's your focus? Because I have learned in life that what you focus on, what you take into yourself, into your eyes, into your thought, into your mind, into your spirit, what you take into yourself, what you focus on over time will begin to influence how you think, how you speak, how you behave, how you react. What you focus on will begin to shape your life. So where's your focus? That's what we're gonna talk about this morning because it's so important that we focus on the thing that God asks us to focus on. So let me start by asking you a question before we jump in. And you do not need to raise your hand on this. I already know what the answer is. So when I ask the question, everyone does not need to raise their hand, but everyone should be prepared to raise their hand. Because if you don't raise your hand, then we're gonna have to talk about lying. And I don't want to have to talk, that's not in the sermon today. So here's the question. Who here has ever broken a promise that they made? Don't raise, I say don't raise your hand and the hands go, thank you for you honest people. Those of you who raised your hand, thank you for being honest and not listening. Um, those who didn't raise your hand, thank you for being honest because I know you would have raised your hand, but you listened. No, uh, we've all done it. We've all made a promise that we broke. Whether it was intentionally, we had no intention of ever keeping the promise, but we just made the promise because it's what mom and dad wanted to hear. I won't go to that party. Yeah, I'm going to the party. Um, uh, maybe it was unintentional. You just couldn't keep the promise because of some situation that kept it. Maybe you completely forgot that you made the promise. It may be a promise you made to someone else. It may be a promise you made to yourself. It may be a promise you made to God. I know this, all of us at one time or another, I promise I'll never do that again. And yet we do it again. We've all broken those promises. But what I know without a doubt, where my, what I know is true based on the word of God, based on the Bible is this, God has never broken a promise. God has never broken a promise. It is not hard for God to keep his promises. The Bible tells us God's not a man that he should lie. Let, let, man, let, let all men be found liars, but God is truth. So God is not going to break a promise that he made. That's not the problem. That's not the issue in God keeping his promise. The issue is in our um, understanding how we look at the promise. It's our a view of what that promise is supposed to look like, the timing on it, the interpretation of it, the method in which we think that God ought to keep that promise. It's all based on our conjecture that we just read into this. This is what that promise means. And the reason that we do that, I believe, is because we want faith, a journey of faith, a walk of faith. We want our faith to somehow assure us that life will turn out the way we think it ought to turn out. That, that that's the payoff to faith. That somehow or other, if I have this type of faith, then God will do this based on his promise. But that's our conjecture. Because the dilemma that we all have to wrestle with is the fact that we know, you know people, I know people, we all know people who did all the right things, who prayed all the right prayers, who had all the right faith, and yet it didn't seem like they got the promise that they were waiting for. And so we say, where was God in that? Was he here with me? Where was he? He didn't keep his promise. Why didn't he move? Why didn't he do something? He must have broken his promise. But if this is true, and it's true that God has never broken his promise, then the problem isn't God keeping his promise. It's our understanding of God's promise. And so that's what this entire series is about. It's about having the certainty, finding the understanding, looking into the scripture and, and gaining the, um, the, the trust that he is here with me, he's here with you, he's here with us, even when he seems absent, even when you haven't received the promise, even when you're wrestling with doubts and uncertainty, he's here with you. Because there will be those times when you say, I didn't get the promise. My parents didn't get 
the promise. My friend didn't get the promise. And they're wrestling with sickness, with finances, with some kind of struggle. And yet, how do we find the certainty that he's here with us even when it doesn't seem that we've gotten the promise? So what I want to do here uh, for the next little bit is I want to read a rather lengthy section of Scripture from the book of Hebrews. We're going to read part of chapter 10, part of chapter 11, and then on into chapter 12. I'm, I normally would ask you to stand in honoring and reading of God's word, but I don't dare ask you to stand for that long, lest someone grow weary and faint and, and fall over and injure themselves, and, and I wouldn't, I would just feel terrible. Um, but I will ask you to stand just for this first part in chapter 10, and then we're going to pray. So would you stand as we honor the reading of God's word? So the writer of Hebrews says this, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured a great conflict full of suffering, remember when you came to faith in Jesus Christ, it wasn't easy. You had to endure some things. Do not now throw away your confidence because it will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Now there's the issue. We say, I wanna receive what was promised. The question is, what was promised? Are we basing it on our conjecture or are we basing it on who made the promise? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and God, I'm asking that you would, by your Holy Spirit, in these next few moments, open our eyes to see a truth that we may have never understood. Open our hearts to receive. God, so that we will have the confidence in you that we would know without a doubt you will never break your promise. But God, we would have our focus on the right thing so that our confidence isn't based on our conjecture, but on your character. God, I'm asking you now, speak through me despite my own limitations and inabilities so that when we leave here, we could say to one another, God has spoken. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. You can be seated. So the writer of Hebrews says that you came to faith, but you had to struggle through some things. Don't lose your faith. Don't throw it away. You kind of have to endure some things. You have endured some things, but you're going to have to persevere if you want to see the promise. And then he goes on or she goes on. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but they go on and they begin to uh, help us to understand what faith is all about. Because there's always been this struggle to conflate and to uh, make a connection between having faith and receiving the promise. It was a problem back then and it's a problem now. So this is what the writer of Hebrews says starting in chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is, the, is having confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It's a confident assurance. This is what the ancients were commended for. This is what all those who came before us we're, we're honored. God commended them. God gave them the uh, gold star. And the writer of Hebrews begins to list out. He starts with having the faith of how God created. And then he goes on to the, the people pre-flood. And then he moves on to Abraham and, and Sarah. And I love what it says about Sarah. It says, Sarah considered him faithful who had made the promise. Her focus was on the one who made the promise. And that is key to our understanding here this morning. And then it goes on. It says all these, so he, the, the writer lists all these people. And it says all of these people were still living by faith when they died. They didn't abandon their faith. Yet they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them welcomed from a distance. If you persevere, if you endure, you'll receive the promise. They had faith. They endured. They didn't receive the promise. See, there's a lot of misunderstanding. And then it goes on. Um, so the writer goes on and, and lists more people and, and, and talks about uh, these acts of faith and, 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 and God moving. And then it goes on. And, and it's kind of like the book of Hebrews is, it's almost like a sermon that was transcribed. And so the, the writer of Hebrews is like, I have a lot to say, but I can't say it all because I say it all, we're never gonna leave. Um, it's kind of like me every Sunday. So 
says this, what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth and David and Samuel and all the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, who through faith administered justice and gained what was promised. If you endure, you'll receive the promise. These died not letting go of their faith, but didn't receive the promise. But these endured some things and received the promise. They shut the mouth of lions. They quenched fiery flames. They escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Listen, those are the promises I want. Man, those are awesome. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Yeah, that's the kind, that's so, you know, that God, I want that promise. I want to shut the mouth of lions. I want to make it through. I want to be victorious. I want to be the person who fights the battle and wins. That's the promise I want to receive. But the writer of Hebrews doesn't end there. Goes on and says this, but there are others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced years in flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and they in mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. Now that summary statement, none of them received what was promised, isn't just that last group that we read about. It's everyone that the writer had listed, even those that said who gained the promise because they didn't gain the ultimate promise. They gained a promise, but they didn't gain the promise. And then chapter 12, verse one. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these people testify to the goodness of God. Their faithfulness to God is a testimony. And since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles. And instead, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, there has always been, since the beginning of the Christian faith, a desire, maybe we the wrong word, um, but this tendency, that's probably the better word, to connect our faith to receiving the promise. That if we have enough faith, if we have the right kind of faith, then we will receive the promise. And so what happens when we do that is we begin to focus on the promise. And we make our faith about the promise, but we're never called to place our faith in a promise. We're called to place our faith in a person. We're called to place our faith in the person of Jesus Christ, the one who was promised by God before even the foundations of the world the one who was spoken of by the prophets, by those who came before. And then the fulfillment came some 2,000 years ago. And now because Jesus came and he was born and he was crucified and was resurrected, we have a point in history that we can look back on and say that is the central point of our faith. So in other words, where is your focus? Is your focus on a promise or is your focus on a person? So here's the first thing you need to understand. Do not, do not, do not focus on the promise. Focus on the promise maker. Don't focus on a promise. We tend to do that. God promised me. Wherever you got the promise from, in your prayer time, God spoke to you. Somebody gave you a message, a word. You saw a vision. You read it in the Bible. Wherever you find that promise, don't focus on the promise. Focus on the one who made the promise. See, if we focus on the promise, then what happens is this. We start to walk in faith. I'm believing for this promise. If the promise happens, we say, God kept his promise. He kept his promise because I had enough faith. Well, what happens then when we don't get the promise? 
What happens when we're like those who were, lives were torn in two, felt like everything was being ripped apart, we're left destitute, we got nothing good happening in our life. We say, guess God didn't keep his promise. And we begin to question him. When we focus on the promise and the promise doesn't happen the way we think we should, it should in the timing we think it should or how we think it should, based on our conjecture, our faith takes a hit. And we question God's ability to keep his promise. Or we say, I didn't have the right kind of faith. I know what I need to do. I just need to ramp up my faith a little bit. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to church more often. I'm gonna give a little bit more. I'm gonna read the Bible more consistently. I'm gonna pray longer. And if I can somehow, and listen, do all those things. Do all those things, but not for the reason to try and get the promise. Do those things because you wanna be faithful to God. But we try and do those things because we think if I can do it, I can find the combination that unlocks the promise. But that means our focus is on the promise and not on God's character, on his goodness. The other thing it does, and it causes our faith to struggle, is that we will look and inevitably say, okay, God, I understand why that person got the promise because they're very pious, they're holy. I mean, they're way more holy than I am, but how did that person get the promise? Because there's certain people that we are just convinced they are not nearly as holy as I am. I mean, they're barely at church. Like once every six weeks, they don't serve. They don't give. They don't do anything. They're just consumers who show up and take. They don't give anything. And yet it seems like they're walking in God's promises, all his blessings, all his miracles. I mean, look at her. She doesn't even acknowledge God in her life. She doesn't even pretend that there's a God. I mean, she's antagonistic to God. She ridicules the things of the Lord. And yet somehow she's walking in your promises. He's walking in your blessings. I don't understand this. And our faith begins to erode beneath our feet because we're focused on the promise instead of the promise maker. So we have to get to the point where we say, what am I focused on? Where is my focus? I want to focus on the promise maker, the one who'll never break his promise, not on how I think, when I think, or what I think that promise should look like. Because if, if we have the wrong focus, we'll begin to think the wrong things. So what we need to do is this. We need to anchor our faith to Jesus, the one who fulfilled God's promise. That's where we need to put our faith. In Jesus Christ, the one who fulfilled God's promise. See, what is the great hope of the Christian faith? What is the great promise of the Christian faith? Is it that if you have enough faith, you'll never struggle in life? Is it that if you have enough faith, your kids will turn out exactly the way you think they should? Is it that if you have enough faith, any sickness will end up being cured? Is it that if you have enough faith, you'll always have the money that you need and you're never gonna have a hard time paying your bills? Is it that if you have enough faith, your marriage is gonna be exactly the way you think it should be? No, the great hope of the Christian faith is that when this life is done, when Jesus comes back, see, he came the first time born as a baby in a manger, but when he comes the second time, he's coming back as a conquering king who will set all things right. The great hope of the Christian faith is that we will spend eternity with God our Father and Jesus Christ because he, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, it's because where I am, there you will be also. That's the great hope of the Christian faith, that God sent his son, Jesus. And God looked and said, you all have messed up. You've sinned. You've done things that hurt yourselves, that hurt others, that wound my heart. You haven't followed the things that I've asked you to follow and live the way I've asked you to live. You've all sinned. And there's no way to fix that. But I'll send my son, Jesus, who will live a perfect life and pay the price for all your sin so that he can remove every obstacle standing between you and God. So that if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you can be adopted into God's family and he will become your heavenly father. Please hear me. I've said this before and I'll say it again. You are not a child of God simply by virtue of being born. You become a child of God when you place your faith in Jesus Christ and you're adopted into his family. And he says, through Jesus, I've removed every obstacle. The only obstacle standing between you and me is your willingness to receive. It's a free gift. That's the the hope that we have. 
Place your confidence in Jesus. Anchor your faith to Jesus, the one who kept God's promise, so that you know and you can have the certainty that God cares about you. God loves you. God hears your prayers. God responds to your situation. He just may not respond the way you want, the way you think, or in the timing that you imagine. Remember last week we talked about uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus and Jesus said this sickness that Lazarus has isn't gonna end in death. And their conjecture said, well, then the sickness will go away and he won't die. The problem was he was sick and he died because they misunderstood the promise. And we so often do that. We look at the promise and say, this is the way it's gonna happen. I'm not saying we don't stand and believe and declare and pray and stand on the truth of God's word. We do all those things. But we have to say, if the miracle happens, if the promise comes to pass, if the mouth of the lion are shut up, if the fiery flames are quenched, if I stand victorious on the mountain, it's not because of my faith. Because if it's about my faith, then what about those who didn't get those things? They were commended for their faith. It's not about your faith, it's about God's goodness, his timing, his faithfulness, his ability to give you things that he has wanted to give you, that he's desired to give you. Sometimes you receive that, sometimes you don't, but it's not based on your faith. What we need to do is focus on Jesus. So in Hebrews chapter two, it talks about the fact that who is man? This is the writer of Hebrews quoting the Old Testament, who is man? that you're mindful of him, who's the son of man, that you care about him, but you have made them a little lower than the angels, but you have subjected everything under their feet. But then he goes on in verse eight and says, but right now, we don't see everything under their feet. Verse nine says, but we see Jesus. He has to be the focus. Where's your focus? But everything's subjected, that's the promise. Everything's subjected under our feet, not yet. Is it a promise? Yes, but it's not based on your timing. It's based on his. So you have to just step back and say, okay, God, not everybody sees those victorious moments. When you see them, when you see that promise, when you receive it here on this earth and in this life, rejoice, I say rejoice. Celebrate, tell of God's goodness. But when you don't, because not everybody does, sometimes life is gonna just be hard and difficult. You're not gonna see the miracle. You're not gonna see the promise. Life is gonna be feeling like it's just uh, coming out of left field and it's hard and your situation's hard and it's difficult. What you have to do is say, okay, I will see Jesus. I will focus on Jesus because the truth is none of them who died then actually saw the promise. But it says they were commended for their faith. They all held on to their faith. They never rejected their faith. They never turned away. What promise were they holding on to? What were they looking towards? The coming of Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus here with me. And then Jesus was born. And now we look and we're still waiting for the final fulfillment of that promise. And Peter, it says this, God is not slow as some count slowness, but he is patient. He's not slow in keeping his promise. What's his promise? That Jesus is gonna come and make all things right. God is not slow in keeping his promise as some consider slowness. He's patient because he doesn't want anyone to perish. So we need to see Jesus and focus on him because there are gonna be times when you gain that promise here on earth and celebrate. But when you don't, don't let it threaten your faith. So what do we do when we haven't seen the promise? What do we do when we're waiting? What do we do when we're struggling? What do we do when life is hard? What do we do when we're just not sure what we're supposed to do? Well, what did we read? It says, faith is the confident assurance of things hoped for. Therefore, throw off everything that hinders you and step away from the sin that so easily entangles. See, those things that hinder us are those thoughts that begin to question God, to doubt God, because we're not focused on God, we're focused on what we didn't get, what we did get, how we got it, how we think we should get it. But don't let those things hinder your faith. Focus on Jesus. 
Don't allow sin to come in because when you allow sin to come in, what you're basically saying is, God, I want to walk in my own way, in my own direction. I want to go in the direction that I want to go in. So in other words, when we begin to sin, we abandon God, we reject God, we run from God and run in our own direction. But I'm telling you, Running away from God, abandoning your faith, giving up on God doesn't make your life easier. It makes it more complex. Running after your own thing doesn't make your life easier. It makes it more complex. Living the way you want to live doesn't make your life easier. It makes it more complex. I'm not saying for a moment sin doesn't feel good. I'm not saying for a moment it's like, man, I cast off all those bonds that were holding me back and I could live how I want and I could be who I want and it feels good for a while. But eventually it makes your life more complex because you'll look back over days, weeks, months, years, and decades and you'll see a train wreck of devastated relationships and wounded people and wasted finances and squandered opportunities and it makes your life more complex. It doesn't make it better. So in other words, don't allow those things that hinder your faith and that cause you to run away from God to get into you. It says instead, run the race that's set before you, fixing your eyes on Jesus. So to summarize, it means this. Run your race focused on Jesus. Run your race focused on Jesus. Here's the problem. We don't always want to run our race. It's the race that's marked out for you. Not the race that's marked out for someone else, but what happens is we look at somebody else's race and say, I want that course. I want those obstacles. I want that discipline. I want that race. I want their race. I don't want my race. Because our race might be marked with difficulties. And so we want somebody else's race. But it says, Mark the, run the race that's marked out for you. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher, the perfecter, the initiator of our faith. So what we need to do is we need to understand that life is like a race. And in a race, there's times where it's flat and you can make good progress. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of resistance. And then there's times it's downhill. And man, downhill is great. You can kind of coast, it's easy. Everyone's where you want them to be. Every one of your children are in a good relationship. Everyone is healthy. You just got the pay raise. Your business is thriving. You got the bonus. Everything's good. There's no problems. No one's sick. You're going, this is great. Listen, when you're in those seasons of the race, when you're in that part that's marked out for you, when it's flat and it's easy, when it's downhill and it's smooth sailing, keep your eyes on Jesus because you will be tempted to walk away from him thinking you don't need him. It, more people lose their faith in times of prosperity than they do in times of ad, uh, adversity. It just doesn't seem apparent. But slowly over time, you go, I really don't need Jesus. I don't really need God. I've got a good brain. I've got an, a good business acumen. I've got a, I can understand relationships. I can read books. I can do all this stuff. I don't need Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus because you will be tempted to take your eyes off of him and think just how great you are. But you may also be in the part of the race where it's not flat and smooth, where it's not downhill. No, you're in the part of the race where it's uphill and it's a steep incline and your legs are burning and your lungs are on fire and you don't know if you have the endurance to keep going. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. You've been married and out of the blue, You've been married for decades or you've been married for months. Your spouse says, I'm done. I'm out of here. I don't want to be married to you anymore because of misbehavior, because of things that they've done, just because of some situation. And it's not what you expected. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. All of a sudden, you look at your child and they've wandered and lived away done things, and you look at them and say, I don't even recognize them anymore. That's not the child I raised. They don't connect. They don't care. And you don't have, know if you have the endurance to keep going. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And the doctor says, it's not a good report. When you've got this affliction, where the doctor walks out and says, I'm sorry, they didn't make it and you're dealing with hospitals, and you're dealing with treatment plans, or you're dealing with funeral homes, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. 
and your finances are topside down and you've made some bad investments and your business is struggling and you don't know how you're gonna pay your bills, keep your eyes on Jesus. See, you were just running your race and everything was good and it was great and you were on the level ground and you were on the downhill and you thought this is the way life's gonna be. Look, God is so good, he's kept all his promises. But the course took a turn and unexpectedly, all of a sudden, it's hard. And if your eyes weren't fixed on Jesus in the good times and you don't keep your eyes fixed on Jesus in the hard times, you will throw away your faith. So don't focus on the promise. Focus on the promise maker. Don't focus, don't anchor your faith to anything except Jesus who fulfilled all of God's promise. In other words, what you and I need to be is we need to be believers who keep on believing. We need to keep on believing. We need to keep on trusting. We need to keep on following. We need to hold on to Jesus no matter what. When something happens in your life, when something happens to someone you raised, when something happens to someone who raised you, when something happens to someone you married, when something happens to someone you grew up with, and it threatens your faith because you didn't see the promise, don't focus on the promise. Focus on the one who made the promise. Be a believer who keeps on believing because when you do, when you continue to believe, when you continue to hold on, when you continue to grab hold of the faith in God through Jesus Christ, it will see you through everything. See, the Bible makes a promise and it's an amazing promise. And it's one, there are promises we can misunderstand. There are promises full of conjecture. There are promises that we can think the timing ought to be a certain way and it's not a certain way. But there are other promises that God is unambiguous about. And one of them is that if you are in a season of struggle, of endurance, of going uphill, of trying your best, just barely hanging on, there is a grace, there is a strength, there is a mercy, there is a provision that God has for us that will see us through if we will run to him. See, God has removed every barrier of access. The only thing holding us back from accessing what God offers to us is us. And this is what Hebrews 4, 18 says. It says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is a grace, there is a strength, there is a provision that God has for us that you will not have at any other time. You've probably seen people who have gone through some stuff and you say, I don't know how they made it through. I don't, I, I don't think I have the, the grace for that. You don't until you need it. You're right, you don't until you need it. That's not God being capricious. That's God saying, I have a promise for you in that season, in that difficulty, in that hardship. I will give you what you need. That's my promise. There's nothing that will keep that from happening except you being unwilling to receive it. So what we need to do is this. We need to realize that God promises the grace to endure. What seems so difficult, God says, I'll give you a grace that will see you through it. Is that grace enough? Yes, it is more than enough. And as you access that grace, as you endure those hard times, as you persevere, as you don't give up, as you go through those inclines, as you hang on through those uh, difficulties, what happens is you don't lose your faith, your faith grows because you look back and you say, remember back then when it was so hard and I didn't know I was gonna make it. I didn't know if I could make it, but I cried out to God for his grace, for his mercy, for his strength, for his provision and he gave me what I needed to get through. If he gave me what I needed to get through back then, now that I'm facing another incline, now that I'm facing another difficulty, now that I'm facing another hardship, I can be certain that if I come to him, he'll give me that same grace. And your faith grows, it doesn't erode. And I have seen this, I've witnessed it in my own life. And I've witnessed it walking alongside people. A mom and her two teenage boys sitting in a hospital waiting room, not knowing if her husband and their father was gonna make it. Doctors came out and said, it doesn't look good. And they're there and they don't know what to do. But they cry out to God, we need your grace. And the oldest boy, 17 years old, 
walks out to his car, grabs his guitar, comes into the waiting room, and they're in a hospital with their father, husband, fighting for his last breath, have a worship concert right in the waiting room. And they say God's grace was there. There was peace. There was a settledness. There was a presence. And when the doctor walked out and said he didn't make it, we all just had peace. How can that be? Because there is a grace that's available that you can't access until you need it. But if you'll run into God's throne room, it's a promise that that grace and that mercy is available for you. I've seen it when people have tears of joy, people have tears of sorrow. You can access that grace whether you're celebrating a wedding or you're mourning at a funeral. You can celebrate that grace. You can, you can experience that grace in every situation. The victories and the defeats. When you say, my womb is empty or the bassinet is full, God's grace is there. If you'll access it, you can see it for yourself. I have seen people who have accessed God's grace and when you do, it will see you through everything and through anything. The Bible tells us that Jesus endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus endured something so that we don't have to endure it. But it doesn't mean we're not gonna have to endure some hard things. But for the joy set before him, what that tells us is there is a joy on the other side. As we access God's grace, there is something that we can look forward to. And that promise is life everlasting with our heavenly father. We're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. I don't believe that just means those that were listed in that passage we read. I believe it means all the men and women of faith who have ever lived, all the men and women of faith who are living right now, right now, right where you're seated, right in this space right here, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Those who accessed God's grace, those who endured, those who held on to their faith, even in the most difficult, harrowing of situations and circumstances, they held on to their faith. They didn't relent. They didn't let go. They didn't hold back. They didn't waver in their faith. And they would tell you if they could, what saw me through was God's grace. So here's what I'm gonna ask. If you have in your life in the recent past or a long time ago, if you have made it through those hard stretches of the race and you can say the only reason I made it through was there was a grace, there was a mercy, there was a strength that saw me through. If that's you, if you can point to that, if you can remember that in your thoughts, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. As a testimony to God's goodness, as a testimony to God's faithfulness, as a testimony to a God who never breaks his promise, as a reminder that we shouldn't focus on the promise, we should focus on the promise maker so that our faith will be anchored to Jesus and him alone, the one who fulfilled God's promise. As that testimony that God says, I will give you grace when you need it. If you can say, I have been through those fires. I have been through those flames. I have been in the lion's den. I have faced life when it felt like it was tearing me in two. And yet God's grace saw me through. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do right now. Just stand to your feet as a testimony to the God who says, my grace is enough. 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 Now, if you're not standing to your feet, look around. That is the testimony to God's grace. And now here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. After everyone, just for a moment, just in an attitude of prayer, we'll just close your eyes. God, I thank you. I thank you for your grace that has seen so many, almost everyone here through those hard times. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your spirit. 
And now, with every eye closed and every head bowed, maybe right now you're in that moment. Maybe right now you're in that situation where you say, right now, oh, I can remember when. I can remember the past. But right now, I need his grace. I am going through it right now. The incline is steep and my legs are burning and I can't take another breath and I don't know if I can make it. Look at this moment right now as your invitation to run into his throne room, to receive grace and mercy when you need it. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. If you need God's mercy, his grace, that's in that situation that you're facing right now in your life today, do me a favor. Just raise your hand up. Just hold it up high. Just hold it up high. Don't put it down. Just hold it up high. Now, here's what I'm going to ask. The worship team's going to come out. And in just a moment, we're going to sing a song. You can put your hand down for a moment, but I'm going to ask you to put it back up. We're going to sing a song. And I want you to look at this as your invitation to receive mercy, to receive grace in that situation, to run into his throne room. You're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And right now, you may feel lost and alone, but he's here right now and he is good. You may be going through a high or you may be going through a low, but he offers you hope. And if you will run into his throne room and you will receive that grace, you will witness his sustaining grace and you will have a story to tell about God's goodness and faithfulness because his promises are are sure. So here's what I'm gonna ask one more time. If you would raise your hand and you say, I need grace right now. I need grace right now. I need grace right now. Those of you who are standing, those of you who have experienced God's grace, do me a favor, look around. Look around, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Look around. And if you see a hand raised as we begin to sing this song about God's faithfulness, about God's goodness, Make your way to them and pray for them. Folks, if your hands are up, you don't need to share anything that's going on in your life if you don't want to. But let them pray grace over you right now. And then as we continue to worship, the prayer teams will be up here and the altar will be open and let God move in your life if you'd like prayer. But let's sing now about God's faithfulness.